Hello and welcome to day 184 of our Bible in a Year Challenge. My name is Sandra. I'm going to be your host for today. Welcome. We are committed to reading and fellowshipping with God's Word every single day of this year, 2024. Please kindly go ahead right now, subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Facebook, on Instagram, and on TikTok at Sandra Boyo Arleba. Let's get started. Let us say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather to continue our journey through your word on this 184th day, we come with hearts full of gratitude and minds eager to learn. Thank you for the grace that has brought us this far and for the rich insights we have gained from scripture. Lord, as we delve into today's readings, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us, illuminate our minds, to understand the depths of your truths and open our hearts to fully embrace your teachings. Help us to see how these ancient words apply to our lives today, transforming us more into the likeness of your Son. We pray for wisdom to interpret the scriptures correctly and for the courage to live out the lessons we learn. May your word continue to be a source of light and strength, guiding our decisions and directing our paths. Bless this time of study that it may be fruitful and enlightening. Strengthen our commitment to reading your word and deepen our relationship with you through every verse and chapter. We dedicate this day and our reading to you, Lord, asking that you would use it to mold us, teach us, and draw us closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Day 184, July 3rd, 2024. 365 Days Bible Reading, Old Testament, 2 Kings 6, 24-33. 2 Kings 7, 2 Kings 8, 1 to 15. New Testament, Acts 22, 22 to 30, Acts 23, 1 to 11. Psalms and Proverbs, Psalm 16, 8 to 17. Old Testament, NIV version, 2 Kings 6, 24 to 33. Famine in besieged Samaria. Some time later, Ben Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for 5 shekels. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord, the king. The king replied, If the lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press. Then he asked her, What is the matter? She answered, This woman said to me, Give me your son, so we may eat him today, and tomorrow we will eat your son. Eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, Give up your son so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth in his, on his body. He said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely. If the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. It's not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him. While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to him. The king said, This disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Second Kings 7, 1-20 Elisha replied, 
hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says about this time tomorrow. A seer of the finest flour will sell for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gates of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. The siege lifted. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the gates, city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we will go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. But if we stay here, we will die. So let us go to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the sea, of the camp no one was there for the lord had caused the arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army so that they said to one another look the king of israel has hired the hittite and egyptian kings to attack us so they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys they left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the city, the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment would overtake us. Let us go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, We went into the Aramean camp and no one was there, not the sound of anyone. Only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I will tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we are starving. So they left the camp to hide in the countryside thinking they will surely come out and then we will take them alive and get into the city. One of his officers answered, Have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will be only like all the Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. They followed him as far as the Jordan, and they found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So a seer of the finest flour sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gate, and he died, just as a man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. It happened as a man of God had said to the king, About this time tomorrow, a seer of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer had said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? The man of God had replied, You will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. And that is exactly what happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Second Kings 8, 1-15 The Shunammites' land restored. 
Now Elisha had said to the woman whose son had he had restored to life, Go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God said. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines seven years. At the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and land. The king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, and had said, Tell me about all the great things Elisha has done. Just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to appeal to the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, This is the woman, my lord the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. Hazael murders Ben-Hadad. Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was ill. When the king was told, The man of God has come all the way up here, he said to Hazael, Take a gift with you, and go to meet the man of God. Consult the Lord through him. Ask him, Will I recover from this illness? Hazael went to meet Elisha, taking with him as a gift forty camel loads of all the finest words of Damascus. He went in and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to ask, Will I recover from this illness? Elisha answered, Go and say to him, You will certainly recover. Nevertheless, the Lord has revealed to me that he will in fact die. He stared at him with a fixed gaze until Hazael was embarrassed. Then the man of God began to weep. Why is my Lord weeping? asked Hazael. Because I know the harm you will do to the Israelites, he answered. You will set fire to their fortified places, kill their young men with the sword, dash their little children to the ground, and rip open their pregnant women. Hazael said, How could your servant, a mere dog, accomplish such a feat? The Lord has shown me that you will become king of Aram, answered Elisha. Then Hazael left Elisha and returned to his master. When Ben-Hadad asked, What did Elisha say to you? Hazael replied, He told me that you would certainly recover. But the next day, he took a thick cloth, soaked it in water, and spread it over the king's face, so that he died. Then Hazael succeeded him as king. New Testament, NIV version, Acts 22, 22 to 30. Paul the Roman citizen. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Read the earth of him, he is not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like that. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Paul before the Sanhedrin the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, so the next day he released him and ordered the chief priest and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Acts 23, 1-11 Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day.
At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome. Psalms and Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 8 to 17. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. In their hearts human plans their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. The lips of a king speak as an oracle, and his mouth does not betray justice. Honest skills and balances belong to the Lord. All the ways, weights in the bag are of his making. Kings detest wrongdoing. For a throne is established through righteousness. Kings take pleasure in honest lips. They value the one who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, but the wise will appease it. When a king's face brightens, it means life. His favor is like a rain cloud in spring. How much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. The highway of the upright avoids evil. Those who guard their ways preserve their lives. Amen. Lessons learned from Second Kings six twenty four to thirty three. Desperation and leadership. This passage illustrates the extreme desperation that can arise during sieges, as seen with the famine in Samaria. It also shows the emotional and moral challenges leaders face under such pressure and stress with the king lashing out against Elisha. Lesson learned from 2 Kings 7, Prophetic Promise and Fulfillment. Elisha's prophecy of sudden abundance amidst famine underscores the miraculous power of God's provision. It teaches that God can change circumstances overnight, providing hope in seemingly hopeless situations. Consequences of unbelief. The death of the royal official who doubted God's ability to provide as he was trampled at the city gate serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of unbelief. Lessons learned from 2 Kings 8, 1-15 Guidance and Provision for the Faithful The story of the Shunammite woman being advised by Elisha to leave her land to own up to avoid a famine demonstrates God's provision and guidance for his fellow followers. Impact of Prophetic Actions Elisha's encounter with Hazael and the prophetic insight into the future violence Hazael would inflict illustrates the profound emotional and ethical dimensions of prophetic knowledge. Lessons learned from the New Testament verses Acts 22 22 to 30 citizenship and rights paul's wise use of his roman citizenship to avoid scourging highlights the strategic use of civil rights in ministry showcasing the importance of understanding and utilizing legal protections for the sake of the gospel acts 23 1 to 11 navigating religious and political divisions paul's astute handling of the division between pharisees and sadducees in the sanhedrin 
demonstrates his skillful use of doctrine and politics to manage his defense. This teaches the value of understanding and navigating complex group dynamics effectively. Divine encouragement in adversity. Jesus' appearance to Paul, assuring him of his mission to testify in Rome, underscores the theme of divine encouragement and reassurance in fulfilling God's mission. Lessons learned from Proverbs 16, 8 to 17. Virtue over wealth. These verses emphasize the value of righteousness over riches, suggesting that a clear conscience and righteous living are more desirable than great wealth with turmoil. Wisdom and guidance. The Proverbs extol the virtues of wisdom, prudence, and understanding as guides for life that lead to stability, perseverance, preservation and honor power of the righteous speech highlighting the importance of gracious speech and the impact of the king's favor these verses teach that the right words can be influential and life directing these passages collectively emphasize the power of god's provision the importance of faith strategic use of personal and legal resources and the enduring value of righteousness and wise speech in navigating life's challenges faith declarations from second kings 6 24 to 33 second kings 7 second kings 8 1 to 15 i declare that in times of distress and famine both physical and spiritual my god is a provider and a deliverer i confess that my trust in god's promises will not waver and i will see his miraculous provision manifest in my life I believe that through divine guidance and wisdom, I can navigate any difficulty and make decisions that align with God's will. I commit to listening to God's prophets and adhering to his word, knowing that obedience brings life and sustenance. Faith declarations from Acts 22, 22-30 and Acts 23, 1-11. I affirm my right and identity in Christ and in the natural realm, using them wisely to advance God's kingdom. I recognize the importance of strategic wisdom to navigate complex situations and to testify effectively about Christ. I am reassured by the Lord's presence in my life, knowing He stands by me in every trial and mission. I will continue to proclaim the gospel fearlessly, trusting that God will fulfill his purpose through me. Faith declaration from Proverbs 16, 8-17 I confess that righteousness and integrity are the foundations of my life. I choose to conduct all my dealings with honesty and fairness, valuing a clear conscience above wealth. I believe that wise and kind words can open doors and create opportunities, so I commit to using my speech to glorify God and edify others. I seek wisdom daily from God, knowing that it guides me to stability, honor, and life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please, if you are blessed by the scriptures and you will like to make jesus your personal lord and savior kindly repeat this prayer after me believing in your heart every single word you say lord jesus i confess my sins and i ask for your forgiveness please come into my heart as my lord and savior take complete control of my life and help me to walk in your footsteps daily by the power of the holy spirit Thank you, Lord, for saving me and for answering my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Congratulations if you said this prayer. We're so excited to welcome you into God's family. Kindly go ahead right now. Send us an email. Let us know you give your heart to Christ. Someone is going to reach out to you and pray with you and help you in your new walk of faith. The email address is salvation in christ 101 at gmail.com that is salvation in christ 101 at gmail.com god bless you please remember to subscribe to my youtube channel follow me on facebook on instagram and on tiktok at sandra boyo areleba
Thank you so much for being here again today. It's always a blessing having you here. I look forward to another amazing day with you tomorrow. Have a blessed day today. I love you. Bye.